Uh, my name is Chris Morin, and I am a Director of Prevention Education and Outreach at Independence House. And I want to welcome everybody tonight to our um, third event, second panel about um, White Ribbon Day. Um, Massachusetts has been celebrating White Ribbon Day for about 15 years, and I believe this is our eighth year. Every year we come together in March to um, recognize that uh, men need to be part of the solution in ending domestic and sexual violence. So um, tonight we have a panel of faith community leaders, and um, we'll, we will begin shortly. Uh, we will start with a recording from our executive director, Lisetta Hurge Putnam. A, a welcome from Lisetta Hurge Putnam. Hi, everyone. My name is Lisetta Hurge Putnam, and I'm the executive director of Independence House. And I am so thrilled to be here uh, just to uh, chat with you this morning about White Ribbon Day and in specifically the White Ribbon Day campaign. Um, so welcome, you know, Mar it's March, and that's when we uh, celebrate or acknowledge, recognize White Ribbon Day. And I feel so privileged to be able to partner with the Cape and Islands District Attorney's Office, the Yarmouth Police Department. And while I feel privileged, it's really the men's action um, group at Independence House that's really spearheading this year's campaign. And uh, I want to give them credit for that. So what is White Ribbon Day and why are we even doing it anyway? So what it is, it's a global campaign of men and boys. They're coming together to really take a position to end violence against women. And this year's theme is Unite Men, to end gender violence. And, you know, we use terms a lot, gender-based violence, domestic violence, intimate partner violence. So I think it's important to give a definition. What exactly is gender-based violence? It's a general term that we use to describe violence that is rooted in exploiting unequal power relationships between genders. So that's a mouthful. What is that? What's an example of that? An example of that would be what we com commonly call domestic violence or intimate partner violence. It could be elder abuse, sexual violence, stalking, trafficking. Um, and you know, once we put it in those terms, I think it becomes clear about you know, what exactly are we talking about when we talk about gender-based violence. So what does it mean for men to come together to end violence against women? There are, you know, a lot of things that men can do. And while I'm not here to offer those solutions, um, I always like to make some suggestions based on what's in the literature. So according to Tony Porter, and if you don't know about Tony Porter, Google him. Um, he has a website called A Call to Men. And I want, always want to attribute my quotes to him. And what he says on his website um, research by the World Health Organization shows that men and boys who subscribe to rigid traditional notions of masculinity are more likely to report having used violence against an intimate partner. So what he says is that intimate partner violence is more often committed by men, and he's not the only one that says that research shows that. Therefore, they must be at the forefront in working for solutions. So Men and women, we empower, men empower themselves when they work to prevent violence against women or end violence against women. And as women, we empower ourselves when we invite men in to do that work alongside us as we've been doing for many years. So um, think about this, I leave you with this. Violence against women is a learned behavior. Men's violence is a result of the way many men learn to express their masculinity and most individual acts of men's violence are an attempt to assert control over others. The result is that women are denied basic rights that most men enjoy. The right to safety in their own homes, the ability to go out at night, a job that is free of harassment, 
when a woman faces a threat of violence, it usually comes from a man she knows. Her boyfriend, husband, father, employer. We live in a society in which words are often used to put women down. We're calling a girl or a woman a bitch, a freak, whore, baby, or dog is common. What language sends a message that females are less than fully human? When we see women as inferior, it becomes easier to treat them with less respect, disregard their rights, and ignore their well-being. Pop culture per perpetuates our ways of thinking and reinforces our gender behaviors. So um, this is not um, a moment of preaching, but more an invitation to examine your own attitudes and actions and think about how they may perpetuate sexism and violence and work towards changing them. Don't be complacent because you feel you're different than men who feel they have a right to control women. Whether you like it or not, simply by being a man, you benefit from the safety that comes with male privilege. So that's one action that you can take if you're looking at this introduction today. And uh, thank you for your participation and um, look forward to our continued work together over the years. Thank you, Lucetta. So um, the program now is a panel of, of faith community leaders here on Cape Cod. And I'm gonna turn it over to Tom Kirkman, who is the, uh, the moderator for the evening. Okay, Tom. Thank you, Chris. Um, good evening. It's, uh, it's good to see all of you here. I'm Tom Kirkman. I'm on the board of Cape Cod Council of Churches and also the advisory board of Safe Havens Interfaith Partnership, which is a Boston-based nonprofit that does trainings and consulting with clergy of every faith across the country. And tonight, I'm really looking forward to the discussion of the four people that have joined us from our local community. Um, you're going to hear from them in just a minute. But just one thing I'd like to say is that um, in thinking about um, these new friends, uh, I was thinking of a line that Oscar Wilde said. He said, it's absurd to divide people into good or evil. They're either fascinating or tedious. The people I'm about to introduce you to are fascinating. So with me tonight is uh, Pastor Reed Bear, the West Parish of Barnstable. <clears throat> the uh, Pastor Christian Hullock of St. Peter's Lutheran Church in Harwich. Reverend Darren Morgan of the Federated Church of Orleans. And Reverend Will Voss of the First Congregational Church of Yarmouth. So friends, um, why don't we just go around um, and introduce yourselves to our viewers. Tell us a little bit about your background um, and why you're here tonight. Um, so let's, we'll do it alphabetically. We'll start with you, Reed Bear. Hello, all. Reed Bear here, um, pastor at West Parish of Barnstable United Church of Christ. That's in West Barnstable. And um, um, I'm an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. I've been serving this congregation since 1998. So while I may be awash ashore, I've been ashore a little bit. Um, I'm married, have four children, three girls uh, and a boy. Um, and um, we've been longtime supporters of Independence House, um, viewing that as a valuable partnership uh, that we support with our outreach efforts and such a cornerstone of, um, of our community. So when I was asked to be on this panel, I, I just jumped into, not because I pretend to be an expert in, in this area, but because I want to be helpful. So here I am. You're muted, Tom. Sorry about that. Uh, Christian Halleck, let's hear from you. I'm Christian. I'm a Lutheran pastor. My wife and I are co-pastors at St. Peter's Lutheran Church in East Harwich. And we have been sharing this call there since 2006. Um, I'm a father of two daughters who are both in college now. And um, I feel delighted and privileged to be part of this conversation, to receive this invitation from, from Chris, 
from Chris Morin. And our congregations had the opportunity most recently. Um, she worked with us in hosting um, Independence House's T-shirt project, which perhaps later we'll talk about more, but that was very powerful for our congregation and, and for me as well. Um, Thank you. Um, Darren Morgan for Orleans. Good evening. I'm Darren Morgan, um, pastor of the Federated Church of Orleans. I'm, um, Reed talked about Beacon Wash Ashore, but I'm, I guess you could say I'm the, the most recent Wash Ashore in this panel, um, only having been here um, not quite two years. Um, and of course, arriving right when COVID had, had begun. Uh, my husband and I come from the great state of Maine, where I have done my ministry uh, for many years prior to coming to, uh, to the Cape. I have a background in law enforcement and in social work. So these issues um, uh, have always been foremost in, in uh, my heart and in my work um, prior to ministry um, and continue to be a, a passion during my ministry. And so by coming here to the Cape, um, this has given me an opportunity um, having to accept uh, earlier last year um, an invitation from Independence House to be on a panel and uh, pleased to be uh, here with you tonight. Thank you. And Will Voss, how are you? Glad to be here. I'm the pastor of the First Congregational Church of Yarmouth. I too am a new wash ashore having uh, arrived here August of 2020, though I've been uh, coming to the Cape uh, as a visitor ever since I was a child. Uh, I'm a graduate of Princeton Theological Seminary way back in 1988, so been in ministry mostly um, pastoral ministry in the local church uh, ever since that time. Uh, I identify with what you said, uh, Reed. I don't feel like I'm any sort of expert in this uh, topic, but I think it's, it's a very important one and important for us to take a stand. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to be a part of the discussion tonight. And I do know that our church uh, for a number of years has supported Independence House. And so that's uh, another reason to be a part of this tonight. Thank you very much. You raise a good point. Um, none of us really are experts. I mean, while I've worked in the field and in our courts for 41 years before my retirement, I still don't feel like I have a tremendous amount of expertise in this area as I learn something new every time I get into one of these conversations. For those of you who um, have tuned in, we welcome your questions as well. You can put them in the, the chat box and I'll try to uh, read them, but I really want to get a good discussion going among uh, these four friends that are with us tonight. Our goal here uh, coming out of this and out of the whole White Ribbon event is to keep the conversation going, um, not just limit it to our sacred space, but take, her take it outside our doors to the wider community as well. And there's a very strong men's action group uh, affiliated with Independence House that you've heard about. Um, and just making connections like that and making connections with the wider community are so important for all of us. So let me just kind of throw out a first question for you. And let's, and by the way, I'm going to invite our panelists to ask each other questions. Um, I just mentioned that I was in the law for 41 years and no one ever said that, gosh, I wish that guy talked more. So I'm gonna try to uh, keep quiet a little bit and let our guests here speak. First, let me just ask you, can any of you think of a time when someone in your life made a comment or referenced harassment or stalking or violence against women or a partner? and you felt you were not able to speak up or do anything in the moment, could you describe an occasion when that might've happened to you? Just feel free to jump in. You know, usually these things happen. I, I was in the service for four years mm -hmm. and certainly I heard a lot of comments. Um, and there may have been times in your education in school or, or something um, when you really felt like, boy, I, I should have said something there. I should have done something. 
The, the one I think of um, in uh, my own experience over many years, um, I used to be a part of a much more conservative uh, denomination than the one I'm a part of now, one that um, uh, would have had uh, only male clergy, only male elders and deacons in the local church. Um, and so one that, um, as the presenter at the beginning talked about, you know, would have subscribed to um, much more traditional roles in marriage. And I can remember a discussion that happened with a group of local clergy and one of the pastors who I knew uh, mentioned how there was a situation in his church where there was abuse going on, the, the husband abusing uh, his wife, and the church actually encouraged the wife to stay with her husband because of their traditional views on, on uh, marriage. And I can remember being horrified by that at the time, but uh, not speaking up to say anything because it, in a sense, it was part of the system. It was a systemic problem. And uh, yeah, I can say more about that later and changes in my own life since that time, but uh, that's a time I think of when I, I should have spoken up and said something, but didn't. How about you others? Did you experience anything like that in any um, setting similar to that, a denominational setting or any group of congregations or anything like that? The abusive relationship where um, the survivor or victim is told, no, you just need to stay in the relationship. I've had um, parishioners um, coming from other denominations uh, who um, have kind of echoed much of what Will had said um, that in their prior in their prior faith lives they had been uh, indicated to stay with with a relationship and that's why they had um, escaped um, from not only the um, the marriage but from the faith community, uh, which uh, I found troubling. Yes. Christian, you've done a lot of traveling or uh, living in uh, other places and, and around the world, as I recall. Do you experience or recall anything like that in your? I, I think for, um, for, for me, most of my experiences have been perhaps in a, in a lot of ways I've been perhaps in a fairly both privileged and sheltered environment. And because of that, you know, when it, when you first ask this question, I don't have, I don't have that much that much that comes to mind d directly in that sense. What, what has happened is afterwards, when I hear people's stories, sometimes when I've gotten to know people, so, so it's not something that's, um, happening in the moment and I miss an opportunity, have or miss an opportunity to speak up or act. But it's after sometimes um, getting to know someone or, or a couple of times after going to the breakfasts that Independence House had held and hearing some of the stories and feeling this, this tremendous sense of um, just like shock that, that, that people, that, that people are going experiencing this and then just realizing the statistics, how, how, what the statistics are and knowing that these statistics, you know, affect people in our churches and in our lives. And all of a sudden realizing then, you know, this is happening around me and I'm sort of living in my bubble. Um, so even if unintentionally, and so it ties in also to I said, us comment about, about, um, you know, privilege and then hearing people share their stories became very aware of the damaging culture of silence that has often existed in churches and have had several times where people in congregations have talked about, um, you know, when I thought something was far away or removed and then they would share parts of their life story and, and realizing that, that in some cases the church has been harmful 
and in other cases, if not harmful, is missing an opportunity to do something positive, missing an opportunity to help change the culture of, um, you know, the, the way I think Independence House and the Jane Doe um, organization puts it is changing the culture of masculinity. Reed, you're nodding in agreement. Do you have anything you'd like to throw in there? Yeah, I, what Christian uh, Christian said um, really uh, echoes my experience. And, um, you know, in a way, uh, when I first uh, heard this question, I'm like, would that there had been that red flag moment, you know, where um, obviously someone said something that was just totally beyond the pale as far as I was concerned. And I'd have and I had a chance to respond and I just didn't don't have any. But at the same time, I think as I prepared for this um, panel discussion, what really struck me, I think one of the questions that I was circulated earlier um, sort of references was, uh, I know someone who's been the subject of um, IPV and uh, et cetera, et cetera, had experience with them. Well, duh, yes, I do. <laughs> and my congregation's full of them. If you look at the statistics, of course, a bunch of them, do I know about it? No, did I, you know, but I mean, it's it's an epidemic. It's such a such a serious problem. But there's this culture of of silence around the issue, so that often um, and most often, um, it just doesn't come to my attention. And so, as as so as, as Chris John said, it's kind of like I live in this sheltered bubble, and the stuff's going on. I don't know about it. Why do you suppose that is? A anybody really? Uh, why? I mean, I've I've run into that in some of the outreach work I've done with congregations where I'll meet with the pastor or the rabbi or the imam even, and they have no idea what's going on at that level. Why, why do you suppose that? Are you being deliberately left out of, of hearing the stories? Is that, well, you're nodding. That's you. Abs think that absolutely. Of course. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, the, 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 the sense of shame that is shame. around the whole issue is is just so debilitating. Uh, the abuser is not going to go around telling people. The, uh, the, the victim, uh, the survivor, um, often wants to stay in the relationship, but just wants the abuse to stop. But senses if they if they share that, it's it's going to have harmful effects on the relationship, um, et cetera. So it just doesn't get like said and i and i beyond all that i think the fact that that i'm i'm a male of a certain age maybe age doesn't have anything to do with it it's part of the problem is that if a woman is being abused by a man maybe going to a man to complain about the talk about the problem is not gonna not her first go-to and i think sometimes though i think that the the um the shame people feel and that culture of silence goes beyond just men i have um a colleague in ministry, and when we were once talking, she said, she, she mentioned, she's like, that at, at one point her, her daughter, I think when she had graduated from college, said to her mom, the first time I was raped, and her mother was completely shocked. Yeah, uh, uh, Will, you, you were nodding too, it's, you, you're obviously agreeing. Any yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the contributing factor to this is that um, uh, people put on their best face in church and in front of the pastor, you know. So, so as I reflect on my past experience, it's sort of shocking to me in a way that um, I've dealt with this directly so few times. You know, because it's got to be going on a whole lot more, I would think, than than what I've heard about and been able to help with directly. Um, but the pastor doesn't find out because um, it's it's just the nature of the institution. You know, Tom, a, a totally different sort of maybe dimension or spin too, but that's perhaps interesting and important as a pastor, there's a lot of really troubling Bible stories <laughs> in which, um, that, that are terrorizing, that have terrifying violence in them. And I think often, and perhaps for, for a number of us, we were not trained well in how to 
in how to speak to them. And so I think sometimes even as preachers, there are certain texts we haven't touched. And there are certain, you know, just to take something like in the Old Testament where you have like Leverite marriage, well, Leverite marriage, or there, there's a, there's a, you know, if, um, if a husband dies, then the, um, the brother the, the wife is supposed to marry the brother to keep his line going and so forth. And, and there are things that, um, or, or the punishment for somebody who raped someone was they had to marry them. And, and it was intended in the context to give accountability. But there's, there's a lot of passages, I guess, where, where I feel like um, when you ask this question, when have I been silent? There are times when perhaps I've been silent about a scripture that had something where I could have spoken out that might have brought a lot more healing by challenging something really disturbing in the scriptures. And in my tradition, when we say the scripture is the word of God, a lot of people, you know, they, they um, a lot of authority is given to, to the word. And it probably, so, so that would be another, another realm, I think, where, where perhaps I would say I've been more silent than, and, and, and many colleagues than, than, um, yeah. Then is good. You could say, really, it's the institution of the church that has, by its silence, perpetuated um, uh, survivors not um, receiving accountability from from those that have been abusive. I had a fascinating discussion along these lines just recently. Um, since coming to this church. Um, I've had an amazing, to me, uh, invitation. The women of the church invited me to lead a Bible study for them. This is the first time I've <laughs> ever led a Bible study just for women uh, in the church in my whole career. And I'm, so I'm the only man there. And um, recently, uh, we've been doing this for a while, uh, but recently we uh, uh, decided to discuss a book entitled The Bible Now, by uh, one of my former professors, Richard Elliott Friedman, and it looks at uh, five sort of controversial topics um, in the Hebrew scriptures. And it has one whole chapter on women and some of those issues uh, you were talking about that, um, you know, where there's such vast cultural differences. So it, it was a fascinating uh, discussion, you know, with, with the women of the church about the Bible and what it has to say about women and, and, and what do we do with that today as, as Christians, as people who revere the Bible, um, and, and what does it mean for God to speak to us through the Bible, but uh, not necessarily endorse all of the um, the the views that seem to be there in the text. That's a that's a really interesting point, um, and maybe that turns this discussion a little bit towards what you do in your sacred space and and in your preaching. Do you lift up? Have you lifted up other parts of the Bible um, that it, that? touch on this sort of thing. And I'm not talking about the, the most general things, but some specific points, you know, the story of Esther or something, you know, that you talk about because you want to uh, make a point about safety in, in your, your space and safety for survivors. One thing the, the women in uh, the group I was talking about, um, kept pointing out over and over again in our discussion, we were looking at the Hebrew scriptures. And um, so the comment was made several times, you know, about how different Jesus was than the culture in which he lived and, and in the way that Jesus treated women. Um, so yes, there, there was discussion of, okay, this scripture says this, but in other places we see a, a different witness. We hear a different voice. And, and sometimes in something as simple and as personal, like for me, as talking about the names of my daughters, their names are biblical names, Joanna and Lydia, women in, women in the Bible who, who in, 
have beautiful stories associated with them who who have leadership who are witnesses to the res you know to the resurrection and and being able to celebrate that and sort of and talk about how we're all created in the in the image of god and um i mean that so i would say yes there's how about it reed any or darren uh any biblical references that you uh rest on and well i tend to be a, a a lectionary preacher um and but yet also you know cognizant of what's going on in in the world around so lifting up those scriptures as they as the the lectionary cycle unfolds it um, but have used the opportunity um last year and still trying to get to know the congregation too um but took the opportunity last year uh, for domestic violence month um, and, and also have used um, uh, 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 Mental Health Month uh, to lift up and, and to apply those uh, passages from scripture um, as it came up in that lecture cycle. What I was trying to do really through, um, through the, the text is to kind of give folk um, uh, the sense of uh, that I could be trusted to hear people's stories. Um, that there was um, there'd be no shame um, by their revealing their you know, uh, true secrets or uh, for any kind of violence or mental mental health history that they might have or or any other issues in their lives um, that I that I would be through my office a safe place in which uh, um, to that people could come and so kind of building on that relationship um, or to in my case, only been here less than two years to kind of begin that relationship um, that uh, I was a safe person to talk to. That's really an excellent point. Um, and I'm sure the others of you have, have thought of that as well, but that is so critical to working with survivors and, and victims that it is a safe place. Um, are there other practices that you may have introduced into your own ministries? that would express that to have people step forward and say this it's okay we know that i, I saw a quote once it said that um, animals look for a safe place when they're threatened but people look for a safe person and so um how do you engage that or how do you project that you are a safe person having met each of you perhaps somewhat briefly but I suspect you are safe people. Um, any comments on that? I think um, one practice that is important is 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 breaking down that um, stereotype of the church as a place where we have to put on only our best face. Mm -hmm. Like I was saying before, uh, that that uh, we're all, if not perfect, almost perfect. Um, and so for me as a pastor, admitting the fact that I'm not, you know, in, in whatever ways I can find to do that in, in a sermon or everyday conversation. And, um, and of course, obviously believing that, you know, and, and believing that I'm dependent on grace, you know. Uh, so, so I think the way we speak about our own struggles as pastors, and there's appropriate ways to do that and inappropriate, but um, I, think, I think that helps to open up the potential for conversation. And have you found that works pretty well? I think so. You'd have to ask my people in the congregation, I think. <laughs> My parishioners. I I found one one blessing I have here. That one of the blessings of being a co-pastor with my wife here has been that it's given people the opportunity to sometimes turn to one of us and sometimes the other for whatever reasons, whether they feel more comfortable, safer, or just so it's it's made it's made that dimension a little bit easier. Um, I would, I would echo that my my spouse is the associate pastor over at West Parish and uh, and she has a, a has a much easier connection with um, 
the women of the congregation, particularly the younger women um, uh, than I do. And um, so they they can pick and choose who they who they w- would like to come to. So and I think also, <clears throat> I think the symbolism, uh, Christian, that that our churches both share of having a woman in the pulpit, a woman in a position of authority, I think uh, might um, make it easier for people to to um, come forward if they wanted to and feel safe. Um, I, I am, I am, I just, I share the concern about 2000 years of a theological tradition, which often um, supported the subjugation of the subordination of women to men, um, that women need to obey their husbands, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we can parse the, we can parse the, the biblical text and say, uh, that Paul was looking for a mutuality of, of love in the relationship. Um, but that wasn't o- often the case over 2000 years. And we have the weight of that, I think, in society, which reinforced the um, uh, the willingness of many to um, treat women as less than and, and, and how that feeds into um, IPV. So I think that the challenge for us as clergy is um, just to be aware of that tradition that goes far far beyond me and what a nice guy I am and <laughs> what a nice guy we all are. Right. I mean, that, that, that tradition, I think I, has a weight. One and part of this um, was intentional and part was unintentional. I think one of the most um, powerful things we did was when we had this opportunity to work with Chris and hosting the, the, um, the t-shirt, the, the, the t-shirt project. Um, and I think part of the reason, the unintentional part was our church building, the structure, it was very difficult to figure out at first, how are we going to display the, the, the t-shirts? And for people, if anybody's not familiar, and I'm not going to get it exactly right, but there were t-shirts in different colors for for survivors who were living, survive, for those who had died from from domestic violence or sexual assault. And um, and th- there were t-shirts in different colors that each represented different um, experiences that people had. And um, so the, the t-shirts were done, were made by survivors or by their friends if they were not living. And they expressed sometimes hope and sometimes pain. And some of them were angry and some of them were they just expressed everything, but there was a lot of really, they were, some of them were very, very raw. And they told a story that, that, uh, so what happened was not knowing what we were going to do with the t-shirts. We had some time ago, um, we wanted to start using some art in our, in our building, in our church building. And we realized the only place we could really display the art was in the sanctuary. That's where we had these long walls on which we could add railings. That was a big step for us because we come out of a tradition that was less focused on the art and more on the word, on word and music, but not wanting the distraction of art. And we sort of made that 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 change, but we made a commitment saying whatever art we hang on the walls is going to be connected to our worship or education. It's going to be connected. It's not just decoration. It's connected to who we are. And and so in talking to Chris, we said, these t-shirts are going to go up in the sanctuary. We're going to hang them where we, where we hang the, the paintings. That's terrific. Put it, putting, putting them into that space, not having to say a whole lot, letting them tell their own story, but to say it was just as powerful for me. And I think for many people in the congregation to say, yeah, this is hard and this is painful just to, even t- to witness this but to let that speak and to try to to try to have that be sort of like what you were saying Darren about saying what will allow people to feel like I can come forward or um and whether it's to me or whether it's to another parishioner maybe it's just that that day talking to another person in the church but anyway so that the, the environment that the church is supposed to, uh, to relate is that we are in this together, that we are not alone, uh, and that in, collectively, as a community of faith, uh, we stand uh, stronger uh, together rather than trying to face things um, individually.
Darren, um, while we're we're looking at you, um, I, you don't have a co-pastor, do no. you? Um, and so there's a challenge there, I assume, for you, um, you know, of trying to express your openness to people. Are there any, can you talk to us a little bit about that, how you try to be welcoming to someone that has this hidden story of abuse? I think to a certain extent, um, you know, the, uh, not that I have a, a, a story that uh, equates anyone else's, but, you know, as being uh, openly gay, having experienced discrimination in the church um, and having relayed that story to the church um, and having survived that reckoning that I encountered throughout my ordination process, um, that, you know, here I can speak from my personal experience of what it, it felt like, what happened to me, um, to then say, you know, as much as I had been hurt by the church, I am still here because I wasn't going to let an institution um, drive me away from my faith. So it's creating this sense of openness of who I am as a person that people could trust me with what they're going through. That's, that's terrific. You know, we kind of started this conversation with that question about, was there a time that you weren't able to speak up or do anything when you heard some remarks or something? Can you think of a time in your lives when actually you did speak up? And, uh, and talk about that a little bit, where you may have heard um, somebody talking, uh, you know, about harassment or stalking or violence against women or anything like that and said, whoa, you know, it's time to speak up. Was there a time that you were able to do that? For me, um, part of my earliest experience in, in ministry while I took place while I was still in college and I worked for an organization that um, uh, started and, and operated the National Youth Crisis Hotline, which um, at that time was the first um, such hotline uh, in the United States for runaway youth. And um, I, I was the lead counselor on the hotline for quite some time. And so I regularly talked to young people who were um, in many cases running away from situations of abuse. So uh, while we wanted to reunite uh, kids with their families, we, we had to be very careful of, of those situations, not send them back to an abusive situation. But many of them um, then and now survive on the streets by uh, prostitution. And uh, so experience that, um, those sorts of abusive uh, situations. And, um, you know, as I think about my whole career, you know, that was one time where over and over again, I was able to be part of a, a little tiny part of a solution in somebody's life, you know, getting them, as you were talking about, to a safe place. Um, and I feel good about that. I, I, I wish I had more opportunities like that. Well, it doesn't sound tiny to me, and I'm sure to the person it was a very big, big piece. Um, anybody like to share any other experiences of, of that nature? You know, it, Sounds like that's outside the building, you know, that's out in the community in a ministry that is, can be pretty powerful. Do you have any, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say too, I mean, uh, you know, we talked about our different uh, family relationships for each one of us and, um, you know, it's it's so important to start at home by the kind of relationships we we model. You know, I've been married for over thirty years. I have three grown sons, and um, 
I'm, I'm not sure I can remember a specific conversation about these matters with, with my sons, but I, I hope that they saw, you know, a model in our home life of, of equality and, and living together peaceably and, uh, you know, the opposite of what we're talking about, the opposite of the abusive situation. I, I just think it's so important to train up boys, you know, to, to have a different mentality. That's an interesting point. Lisetta mentioned uh, Tony Porter. And um, in his work, he talks that, um, you know, we're taught to act like a man when we're growing up. Um, and I think what is missed there is it ties in directly into an intimate partner violence and what drives it that Porter would say, we're taught to be abusers because we're taught about power and control, controlling other people, being tough, and having that power over others. Um, so how do you feel about that? I mean, you know, T Tony Porter has made a kind of a career of this after his um, athletic career um, of reaching out to boys in, in that, the way you suggested, Will. You're nodding. Any thoughts of uh, good practices or best practices? What you can do in uh, in your your faith communities, in your church settings. Well, going to Will's point, as far as modeling, um, but that would also go then modeling in your uh, church governance and leadership structure that there is uh, an equality to, to leadership, um, that uh, no, the uh, chair of the trustees doesn't have to be a man, um, or the chair of the finance committee doesn't have to be a man, um, uh, to, to, to look intentionally at, the, at um, who you raise up in leadership um, throughout the church, as well as who uh, is visible in leadership positions, whether it be a, as a, a liturgist or um, a deacon or a greeter, that there is this sense of uh, seeing uh, all welcomed and highlighted in positions um, that bring out the best in everyone. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Uh, you know, I talked about the conservative denomination I used to be a part of. I'm not, I'm not in that anymore. And, you know, I'm thankfully in a church where that equality and in, in leadership is, is modeled and that, that changes the whole dynamic. My last church, uh, I, I was in Stowe, Vermont, and, and pastored the Stowe Community Church, which was kind of like a federated church, but because uh, they, <clears throat> they had four different churches come together to form that community church, but they, they actually, in that case, gave up all their denominational connections. But um, the, the church, while, while it had... Um, equality of leadership, uh, you know, on the church board, et cetera, and all the committees and everything. They had never had a uh, woman, so far as I know, they had never had a woman preach from the pulpit. Um, and I had heard that um, their search process that led to me, uh, you know, there were some people who wanted to consider having a woman, but other, others didn't, you know. So they were willing to have equality up to up to a point, and uh, mm. uh, I was glad that I was able uh, during my time there to uh, invite a woman to preach uh, on one occasion from the pulpit. I thought it was kind of a historic uh, moment, but uh, yeah, changing those structures I think is so important. It's interesting on a perhaps like I remember my. Um, my wife will sometimes she'll have come home with the story of going to the hospital and she's wearing her clerics. This was a number of years ago, but going to the hospital, she's wearing clerics. She's coming out of the hospital and she had parked in the clergy parking lot. And some guy shouts at her, that spot is only for clergy. Why are you parked there? And 
So just, I mean, those kind of experiences, which make me again, just realize, you know, the, 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 the privileges one sometimes takes for granted as for me as a white, as a white male. Um, and it, it's sort of a growing edge. The um, some of the things you've been commenting on, and that also um, I think Tony Porter alludes to, and the Jane Doe and Corp uh, Jane Doe um, when they talk about changing masculinity. As you know, I recently had a conversation with my my older daughter, and I liked the way Chris Moore Chris Moran's invitation talked about. You know, we can respond tonight as a man, a father, sp as a spouse or partner as a minister and so that led to some good conversation with my daughter and and i shared how as a father you have this desire to want to make sure that your daughters are safe you want to make sure they're and so you tell them do this or don't do this because you want to keep them safe but the pushback from from her sometimes would be you know dad you're really focused on the things i need to do to be safe but the other side of the coin is like that whole culture of masculinity. What am I, what are we doing to change that? And so she forwarded me something, um, like it, this one happened to be written by a uh, social researcher, Jackson Cotts, and he asked men what they do on a daily basis to avoid being sexually assaulted. And um, the answer was basically like, nothing. I'm not, I don't wake up worried that I'm gonna get sexually mm -hmm. assaulted today. And then he asked women and it was like, you could just go through the list. Like I, I, I you know, I, I don't always drive home the same way. I watch who pours my drink. I don't leave my drink unattended. I have mace with me or this or that. And, and I, I, and, and, and the list just goes on and on. And it was like, whoa, okay. Mm -hmm. Like there I am again, like living in my bubble, realizing that maybe something does need to change in the culture of masculinity. If these are daily realities for, for a lot of, for women. Hey, do you have anything you'd like to add on that point? You've got. I, mean, I, I, I really uh, like what, what 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 our fellow panelists have been saying. We're really concentrating on what we might do within the four walls of our churches, and I, I'd like to sort of expand the conversation to to suggest that as many of us are already doing, is supporting organizations like Independence House, which have a real focus on these issues and, um, and actually need our financial help to help carry on the mission that is so important as well. So I see, us, see, see sort of our job is both within the, the four walls of our worshiping communities, but also out, and, out wider into the community, working with partners who... Um, have the expertise, the, the time, and the experience to um, also make a difference in solving the issues. I think that's a really good point. And, um, you know, and, and that can fold into um, work beyond this meeting, too, of just becoming informed as to what is out there. Um, you know, well said earlier, we're not experts on this, but we don't have to be because there are experts out there and, and we can all be connected to them as well. Um, you know, so there's some real opportunities there. Um, and Independence House is a good starting point for that. I think a lot of us ministers are, are, in, it, are in the ministry because we want to help people. And um, the IPV is like a minefield. Of, of ways that we could really screw it up. If we tried to do it ourselves, if we thought we had all the expertise, knowledge, wisdom to, um, to help someone perhaps who comes to us um, as, a, as a victim, a survivor, or on the other hand, if someone came to us as an abuser and thinking that, you know, I think the major mistake, the major learning I've had in all this is like, if we try and do it ourselves, um, we're asking for trouble and we could, like, you know, as they said, the Hippocratic Oath, first, do no harm. We can do a lot of harm. So it's great to have a resource like Independence House out there. And I think where, where, where those things merge in terms of feeling like you're doing something, even if you're, 
even if you're referring to experts, is like when Independence House has stickers like for your bathroom saying, here, here are numbers to call if you're if you are in, in you know, and and after a while, like with like the pictures on, in, in your home, you, you might stop seeing them, but they're there when somebody if somebody needs them. And so that is like another way just to piggyback what you're saying, Reed, of like partnering with of having independence house with their expertise provide simple ways that we can have a bridge to their expertise. That's a, that's a really good point too. You know, the other thing that I've heard, and we've only got a couple minutes left, um, but another thing I've heard you all say is hearing the story. That is such an important role that I, as an outsider, can see that you can do. Um, and I recall the phrase of listening into being, because that's what you're doing. You're bringing this by just simply listening to the survivor um, or victim, you're bringing them into be, being. Um, and there's some real resilience prospects with that, just being present and listening to them, right? Isn't that kind of what you learned in CPE or in your, you know, your pastoral training? Um, that shouldn't be forgotten at all. You're such a critical piece in all of this and to let people know that you're there to hear them and to hear their story. Any final words? We'll just kind of go around. We'll do it alphabetically again. Read final words. Wrap you know, up it just, practices. It just, it just became clear to me. Um, it takes a village um, to help us move towards a world where IPV doesn't happen. None of us can do it on our own. We need educators. We need faith leaders, first responders. We need the legislature. We need the courts. Um, and bottom line, we need every single guy out there um, to work towards a solution on this. Um, and I think our faith communities have a, have a valuable role to play here. And um, good on you for bringing us all together to, to talk about that. Well, thank you. Christian, final words? Um, trying to do what I can in my life and in the, and in the, a family and a congregation to listen and to listen attentively and to listen for who who are the, the people, the voices, the stories we're not hearing and to try to create a space where they can be, where they can be heard. Thank you. Darren. Um, I appreciate the invitation to be part of uh, um, this partnership with Independence House. Um, and I uh, echo with what Reed had said, it's, that it takes a village, that it really is all of us uh, united and working together um, to set aside this uh, kind of the silent shield um, that uh, uh, it would be so easy to think that it doesn't happen uh, when we know it does. Um, and we need to break down those, that barrier of silence. Thank you. And Will, your benediction. Well, I, I agree heartily with uh, what all my colleagues are, are saying. I feel like I've learned a lot tonight just from uh, listening, and we need to carry that listening forward and, and, and work together as a community. Um, as, as a new person to the community, I, I would love to be learning more about the resources that are out there in the community. I know about Independence House. Um, but I'm, I've just re recently realized in a number of situations uh, how unaware I am of resources that are out there, um, psychologists, therapists, um, you know, who also play a part of um, the solution. And um, so I'd like to become more aware of that. Maybe, maybe we can work together to uh, pool resources and share lists of um, the resources that are there in the community. I, I would certainly welcome that. That's a great suggestion. And, um, you know, and I appreciate that. And we'll work on that. I'm, that gives me something to work on. <laughs> I want to thank all of you, though. Uh, this has just been a wonderful discussion. Um, and and I hope I see you again. You know, I'm looking we'll, forward to it, Tom. This up. Okay. Thank you for leading. Thank you. And thank you all for tuning in tonight and in the future. <laughs> okay. So uh, I echo what Tom has said. Uh, 
we appreciate you very much for taking the time and being vulnerable to conversation. I mean, I, I feel like um, that's what we need to do is uh, have these kind of conversations. And yes, we, um, I inc definitely see the faith community as uh, part of our village, absolutely. Um, and so what I'm hearing a lot tonight is, um, I, I believe that each one of you, if somebody came up to you and disclosed something that you would, you would be listening, you would believe them, right? And so the, the challenge is, as we've talked about, is making the, um, the atmosphere of the, of the building and that type of thing open. And so I know that some of you have preached on Domestic Violence Month. Um, uh, so it's it, it, part of keeping that conversation alive is um, not doing it once a year, right? Is uh, how can we figure that out together uh, without overloading people? So, um, so I, I again thank you. Uh, I have had uh, connections with each of you, and so I appreciate you saying yes. And uh, I would say absolutely that you should be part of our men's action. So we'll be in touch. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank Bob. You. Bye. God bless. Good night. Good night now.